Hello everybody, my name is Matt and here we're going to be talking about my most favorite thing in electrophysiology, hyperkalemia. So what exactly is hypo hyperkalemia? Well, the normal potassium is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Anything over that is going to be obviously hyperkalemia. So you got your 5.1 to 6 is going to be mild hyperk, 6.1 to 7 is going to be more of a moderate hyperkalemia. And levels above 7 are going to show severe hyperkalemia. Now you may wonder, well, well, Matt, I'm not in the hospital. Why would I care about some dumb electrolyte imbalances? Like, is this coming from, like, drinking too much Gatorade? Well, concerned person, this is an extremely deadly condition, and I'll teach you how to interpret this on a 12 lead without needing to do labs. So when you have a nurse at the hospital ask if you actually did labs in the field, you can tell them, nah, nah, I'm just, I'm just that good. Uh, so what is so... What is actually so complex and so fascinating with this rhythm is that it can mimic and cause anything on 12 lead. This goes from like mimicking VTAC to causing AV blocks, mimicking STEMIs, uh, Brugada syndrome, causing bradycardia. An interesting tidbit on why hyperkalemia can cause ST elevation and mimic a STEMI is because a potassium current channel, which is located on the myocyte cell in the heart uh, on the membranes, is responsible for the potassium efflux during phase two and phase three of the cardiac action potential and increases potassium efflux when extracellular potassium is elevated. And just so you guys know, efflux is just a fancy term for material that is flowing out. So back to the patho on this. This leads to the shortening of the phase two and phase three action potential, which consequently shortens repolarization time. Hyperkalemia also decreases the resting membrane potential, which prolongs depolarization, which causes the myocyte to become more refractory and less likely to fully repolarize. Enough boring medical mumbo jumbo that I just said. Now let's get into what actually causes hyperkalemia. When you think of what causes hyperkalemia, what's the first thing that you think of? Well, it's going to be the one that I just put up there right now in the front. It's going to be renal fa failure. And that's going to be the most obvious one that everyone thinks about. But what if I told you not every single hype, not a single hyperkalemic patient I have ever had has been on dialysis? Well, here are some ways that hyperkalemia can actually occur. You got your ACE inhibitors, your potassium sparing diuretics, beta blockers, NSAIDs, heparin. You got uh, due to cell death, you got your secondary to rhabdo, uh, massive transfusions, crush or burn injuries. As I said before, hyperkalemia loves a very acidotic environment, which is why it is, will be one of your first killers in your DKA patients. Hyperkalemia can also occur in sepsis and dehydration because these cause hypotension, obviously, and do this, it causes decreased tissue perfusion, which leads to metabolic acidosis with subsequent potassium elevation. What does hyperkalemia show on an ECG? Well, when you go through school, you're taught about the peak T waves for the most part, and, and that's about it. You kind of just look at this 12 lead and you're like, oh, well, this is hyper K. Well, there's so much more to it. Basically, what hyperkalemia does is it just widens everything out until you go to that really stable rhythm of asystole. Let me show you a graph on the next slide to show you how hyperkalemia kind of progresses. Now, the thing with this graph is not a hundred percenter. Sometimes you can have a severe level of potassium in the serum and only have a peak T wave. It is all dependent on the individual and how resistant they are to the serum potassium. So in our dialysis patients, they are highly resistant to higher levels of potassium in comparison to your average Joe because they deal with it all the time. They're, you know, the, your EKG on those patients aren't going to be showing as dramatic a signs as you would with you, know, you or I just, you know, eating a bunch of squash and bananas and then, you know, becoming very hyperkalemic. So you can't always predict the level based off of the 12 lead, but we will go into how it sometimes progresses. So first step, usually your T wave becomes peaked and your PR interval increases. Second is usually your P wave flattens out and eventually becomes non-existent. It causes some QRS widening and that's about it. Your QRS widens and widens and widens until you go into a sine wave noticed here at the bottom and the patient goes into V-fib and then it widens some more until you go into a systole. So how would you actually treat these patients? Calcium, calcium, calcium. Calcium is our best friend in treating any kind of hyperkalemic patients, whether it's chloride or gluconate. 
Uh, calcium stabilizes the myocardium and prevents the patient's rhythm to de degenerate into V-fib. Some more treatments include some sodium bicarb, uh, but with this, there is some considerable debate on using the 8.4% of sodium bicarb because it is very hypertonic in nature, which causes a solvent drag effect, which makes it so the potassium gets pulled into the cells and it does its job, and then about 20, 30 minutes later, it just slowly seeps back out. Isotonic sodium bicarbonate is noted to be a lot more effective option than the hypertonic option. Next is D50 with insulin, which helps pushes the potassium into the cells. And then you can use high amounts of albuterol in conjunction with this. Albuterol is best known to be used with both D50 and insulin. There are some studies out there that show that albuterol causes an initial influx of potassium into the serum which increases obviously the overall potassium in the body and then causes the potassium to then slowly be shifted into the cells. In hospitals, they use K-exalate, which slowly works. It can take hours to days to actually work and isn't usually used in emergency uh, settings. They can use it in the ICU or PCU or something like that. Here's your good old reliable calcium gluconate. Here's the ECG-1. You're going to have a 30-year-old male. His complaint is, I feel like my throat is closing up. You visually inspect the oral cavity and the pharynx and there's no noted swelling anywhere. Patient is not eating anything new and no new no hives noted and negative for any angioedema. Patient takes some oxy but has no other kind of medication. His skin is pale and diaphoretic. His eyes, you notice there's some jaundice in there. His history is, all, is really short. It's just stage 4 bladder cancer. You get him on the stretcher, you do a 12 lead and you get this 12 lead. Also, you notice BGL is 19. Obviously, this is a very this is a hyperkalemia lecture, so this is going to be obviously hyperkalemia. You can see this wide complex here. So when you see this really wide complex, like I said, hyperkalemia just keeps widening everything out until you get to a systole. This is a sine wave right here. You can see that the QRS complex is over a box wide. When you get anything over one big box wide, so here to here, you need to be thinking tox or metabolic issues with these patients. So anyways, you decided to treat this patient. First, you gave calcium and you do 15, 20 mil milligrams of albuterol and your patient's second 12 lead is this. Now the second 12 lead is still scary enough to freak you out, but it does look better than the first. Let's go back to the first. You can see, especially in the precordial leads, you're starting to develop more of your T-wave morphology here. It's coming back, it's shrinking, you're seeing a little bit more of a peak T-wave here in the inferior leads. Before, it just looks like very nasty looking VTAC. And now it looks a little bit, a little bit better, but a little scarier. All right, now for ECG2. This one, you can see how hyper-K is mimicking a STEMI. You can see some of the peak T-waves and some of the precordial leads over here. But for the most part, it looks like an inferior STEMI. You see two, three AVF are elevated, one in AVL are depressed. But you can see when you think the words wide and bizarre, think about hyperkalemia. This doesn't look like your normal STEMI. You can see where the T wave was peaked at one point. Peaked and peaked and peaked. This doesn't look like your average STEMI, does it? So let's go to the next one. This one is also mimicking a STEMI, but this one's going to be more of a lateral and uh, septal STEMI. And you got depression in 2-3 AVF, a little bit of elevation in 1, not much, and AVL is elevated as well, got V1, V2 elevated. It looks very wide and bizarre, and that's your key with Hyper-K. Fourth 12 lead. Here's a 12 lead on a 30 year old male. His father called because he was unresponsive. He does respond to pain for you. Uh, his father advised he's been vomiting and has been doing meth for several days in a row. Here you can see the peak T wave and the QRSs are widening as well. So peak T wave, the T wave is starting to separate from the QRS complex and the P waves are flattened. You can see the P waves are starting to flatten out here. And that's the end of this one. So you, like I said, just Peak T waves, QRS is widening, T wave is starting to separate from the QRS a little more. You, this sign right here, when I do see a lot of my hyperglemic patients, this is kind of what I look for. This up slurring right here into the T wave. You can see it over here, over here. Sometimes when you get these patients, 
when you put them on the monitor, the T waves are so large that your monitor is actually going to count them as another QRS complex. So it's going to give you double of whatever the actual rate is. This patient was found unresponsive by his wife. There's no dialysis or anything like that with this patient. And here's his 12 lead. Extremely wide, right? Like that is massive. This is one of the most severe cases of hyperkalemia I've had. This is one of those 12 leads that will make anyone look at it, look to the sky and say, hey God, it's me again, and hope all the leads are on right. But this is the patient's real 12 lead. All the leads were on correctly. This is not artifact or anything like that. Uh, this is a very extreme hyperkalemia, and you can see the sine wave here. Very bradycardic and sine wave. On the sixth and final EKG that I have for you guys, this is one that I found from ECG Weekly, which is run by Dr. Amul Matu. I reference him a lot because he's an incredible ER physician who gives outstanding lectures. He's got stuff on YouTube and his website, ecgweekly.com. But anyways, back to the case, you can look up at the 12 lead and the doc in the box says, cannot exclude ventricular tachycardia. Now, if you watched my wide complex tachycardia video, you know that this is going to be way too wide for VTAC. The QRS complexes are hitting nearly a box wide. As I said before, if the QRS complex is wider than a box wide, you need to be thinking tox or metabolic for all these patients. This is going to be hyperkalemia mimicking VTAC. And if you give amiodarone to this patient, congratulations, you just killed them. And finally, the recap. Hyperkalemia, when you look at the width of the QRS complex and you see that's over one large box wide, like I said, always think tox or metabolic and give your calcium, especially your bradycardiac patients and stuff like that, give your calcium, stabilize that myocardium. This rhythm comes in so many shapes and sizes. It fits all types of life. It comes in everyone, not just your renal patients. If the words wide and bizarre ever enter your mind, think hyper K at all times. Just because you don't have renal failure doesn't mean you can't go and become hyperkalemic. And remember, like I said, calcium is key. Stabilize that myocardium with your calcium. That is going to be your best friend for your hyper K patients. Now, I hope you guys enjoy this lecture as much as I loved making this lecture and I hope you all have a great day.